All right, ready to go? Yep. All right, good morning. Uh, we're here with uh, Judge Rosemary Barquette in her chambers, and we've been talking uh, this morning for quite some time, and it's been uh, fabulously inter interesting. Thank you. Um, Very mutual. Judge Barquette is, of course, as everyone knows, a member of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal. Uh, she was appointed in uh, 1994. Uh, the judge uh, has a rich background, a very interesting background. She was born in Mexico of uh, Syrian parents, and she became a naturalized U.S. citizen like, like me That's right. uh, in her youth. <laughs> uh, she attended uh, Spring Hill Law College. Well, no, it wasn't law school. It was Spring Hill College. Spring Hill College. undergraduate. All right, and you graduated summa cum laude. I did. And this is a uh, Catholic uh, college in Alabama. Yes, Mobile. Mobile, Alabama, and it has an excellent reputation. Thank you, I think so too. And then she got her uh, JD from the University of Florida Law School in 1970. Uh, she began her professional career as a teacher. Uh, she taught in elementary and secondary schools for seven years. And then after that, she, after she became a lawyer, she was a trial lawyer for another 10 years or so. Yes. And then she was recruited to apply to the uh, trial court bench and she became a circuit court judge in 1979, and uh, because she did such a great job as a trial court judge, she was recruited to apply to the uh, Fourth District Court of Appeal, and she served there for uh, two years, from 84 to uh, 85. Right. And then at some point in time, the governor, and the governor was whom at that time? Bob Graham. Governor Graham uh, uh, nominated uh, the judge to be on the Florida Supreme Court. He did. In 1985, where uh, the judge became the first uh, woman associate justice of the Florida Supreme Court. That's correct. And you served there from 85 through 92, and uh, you, you were also a trailblazer there in that uh, you became the first woman chief justice of the Florida Supreme Court in 1992. Yes. And you were there until 1994, where then uh, President Clinton decided to... Uh, select you because of your excellence and put you on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal. Yes. <laughs> it's a I, mean, I hope that's why. Um, I think that's why. Well, we know that is why. We are, we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you, Judge, for making the time to talk to us. This is an interview uh, conducted for the Florida Supreme Court Historical Society. Uh -huh. And uh, we're trying to make a, a record for our archives about the history of the uh, judiciary in Florida. There are so many things we can talk to you about uh, but today we're going to limit it to one topic, and it's a topic that you are very familiar with, and that is the topic of merit retention in Florida. Yes, I am familiar with merit retention. Great. So we, what we would like is for you to uh, give us your thoughts on, on the whole spectrum, but we're going to start you off by asking you about, uh, give us your perspective as to why you think we have a merit retention in Florida. How did that come about? Well, I think there were many concerns prior to the, uh, to the switch to a merit retention system with the um, uh, contested election process where people could run for office. There were many abuses that were occurring, um, election type uh, abuses. And I think that the people who were concerned about the law mm -hmm. and about Florida in general were concerned that the system of, a, of contested elections was not producing the kinds of judges that we wanted um, in the state of Florida. What kind of judges would that be? Well, I think that the judges in the state uh, and the people in the state were trying to achieve two goals, which is the same two goals, really, that the federal system was trying to achieve when our founding fathers established uh, the, the judiciary as a third branch of government. Um, the first goal is, of course, to provide an entity to resolve disputes, but much more than that, because the way our, our founding fathers envisioned it, and which also is, is the same concept within each of the states, is that there would be um, an entity that would protect uh, minorities and assure that they were receiving their constitutional rights um, and be sort of the in intersection or, or an intermediary between 
the rights of minorities and government or any other ma majority, actually. When you say minorities, you're not just specific as to race or ethnic. No, I'm talking about any group or person that might be disempowered or less empowered than another. So that when I speak about minorities, I'm talking about protecting individuals against the power of government, for example. Mm -hmm. We were the first um, government to establish a, a system whereby individuals could redress their grievances against government, both by petition, by rights of free speech, and also by being able to sue um, in the judiciary that was empowered to rule against government if they felt that government you're, was you're, wrong. You're referring to the federal system. Yes, okay. but it's really the same underlying concept that occurs in, in, in any of the state systems. And so I'm, I'm talking about individuals against government. I'm talking, of course, any group that has become a minority and thereby perhaps lost some of the rights that they are entitled to, racial mm -hmm. minorities during the 60s, women, uh, any other group that is disempowered and that is um, whose, whose rights are being impinged by majorities. Uh, and it is the function of the judiciary to redress uh, those grievances if in fact it's brought before them. So that's one goal. And of course the subsi subsidiary goal is to assure that we have a system in place that will produce the kinds of judges that are fair that are impartial, that are not beholden to any group, um, that are neutral in order to achieve this kind of protection for all of the citizens of our country now, and of the, our states. Was the system that we had in place back then in Florida before the changes, it, it, did it fail in, in, in that I regard? think it did do that. I mean, I think that what people were seeing were that the, the election of, the contested election mm -hmm. of individuals was generating um, races in which money played a huge role because whoever had the most money uh, to advertise and to run a campaign had an edge. It was also a problem because when you run for election, there's a tendency to promise things, but a judge can't really promise to do anything but be fair and be just, and that just mm -hmm. doesn't make for a very um, exciting campaign, as, mm -hmm. as it were. So uh, I think there were a lot of election problems that were generated by that system, and I think that many of the people who were very responsible for um, correcting many of the problems in our then Constitution thought that the merit selection system and merit retention system mm -hmm. would solve a lot of those problems. They had picked it up from other states. I think Missouri was the first one to start the merit retention selection and retention system. And we wanted to implement that in Florida in order to solve the problems that we saw in the contested election system. Now, back, do that. now back then in, in Florida, and, I, and I've been here for 52 years, uh, Florida was predominantly, at that point in time, a state that was democratic. I think that's probably right. So the, 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 uh, back then, these changes that were uh, instituted into the system, it re they really had nothing to do with any partisanship infecting the, the races. No, and in fact, one of the big moves in uh, the state and mm. in many other states was to remove the judiciary from partisan politics. They uh, eliminated running as uh, a, you know, from a political party base so that uh, elections, even, even our contested elections now, are, not, are supposed to be nonpartisan races. Mm where a, it's not a party that fields a candidate, it is any candidate from any party or no party. And technically, you're not even supposed to know what, uh, what political party a particular judicial candidate belongs to. Um, and I think that's actually the fact in many instances, at least so far, and I would hate to see it go back to partisan politics because it's just so antithetical to the idea of a neutral judiciary. But it never was. I guess what you're saying is that uh, b before the system was changed to merit uh, selection and merit retention, it really wasn't partisan at all. The, the I, I think by that time there were uh, nonpartisan judicial elections, but I may be wrong okay. about that, right. Bob, because at one point I'm sure they, they did run as a Republican or as a Democratic or as a party candidate way early in our 
in our history earlier than All right. we know. But when the changes are made to go to the merit uh, selection, <laughs> merit retention, the objective was uh, unquestionably to uh, achieve the goals that you've mentioned, uh -huh. uh, and also to remove any, uh, any any politics or partisanship. Yes, okay. that's exactly right. Now, you enter the system as a, a trial court uh, judge, because yes. you're recruited, right. and you go through a JNC process. Right. At some point in time, you're, uh, you're placed on the, uh, the Supreme Court. Now, at that point in time, and before then as an appellate court, court, court judge, you're subject to retention. Correct. But you become subject to that when you get on the Supreme Court. Yes. Okay, t tell the, uh, the, the people who are viewing this uh, a little bit about uh, your experience with regards to retention, your, what happened to you. Well, uh, first of all, pro when I was on the, um, on the intermediate appellate court, we also had to be on the ballot for merit retention. But historically, um, there really were no, op there, there was no opposition that had been lodged against a judge for a merit retention campaign until the campaign of Justice Ehrlich and Justice Shaw, if I'm remembering correctly. These are Supreme Court justices. They were Supreme Court justices. They were all, both on the court before I was on the court. And an initiative <clears throat> had, uh, uh, had been proposed to make an amendment to the Constitution having to do with taxation. I don't remember exactly the details of it, but the group that was moving for the amendment uh, was upset because the court had ruled that the amendment wasn't an appropriate form and had not permitted it on the ballot. And they challenged Justice Shaw and Justice Ehrlich on the basis of this, um, on the basis of this taxation amendment. And both Justice Shaw and Justice Ehrlich together had to campaign across the state, seek funds from lawyers, run a campaign, in order to retain, uh, to both educate the public who didn't really understand retention campaigns, and then to um, uh, to be to be retained, so uh, they, they would tell some very funny stories. Justice Shaw is black. Justice Ehrlich is not, and they would tell funny stories about Justice Shaw driving the car and. Ehrlich wanting to at times sit in the back so he could be <laughs> projected as being driven like uh, Miss Daisy, I suppose. But they had a wonderful relationship and they, um, they successfully weathered that merit retention campaign. The following, that, that, that would have been in the early 90s? That would have been before that, okay. actually, because six years later when Justice Shaw was up again, he was Chief Justice at okay. the time, and he was challenged again, this time, by a group uh, who were upset with a privacy decision that was made um, regarding the passage of the parental consent for uh, uh, whether or not a minor needed parental consent for an abortion. The court ruled that because there was no judicial mm -hmm. bypass, there was no way to have uh, an individual uh, seek to avoid parental consent in situations, for example, of parental rape, mm -hmm. uh, which did occur, uh, that the statute was faulty and had to be reconsidered by the legislature. Because it was unconstitutional pursuant to the privacy rights in Florida's yes. constitution. Yes, so Justice Shaw was challenged and he had to run a retention race. And then the following year, or two years after that, I believe, and I'm not remembering the timeline correctly, mm -hmm. but. After that, then I was challenged. Um, my records having, revealed, Judge, that it was yes, in 1992. That my retention campaign uh, occurred. Yes, I think that's correct. All right, so so you, you get put on the, the on the ballot because the yes. Constitution requires that you right. be subject to retention. And the rules say that you need not do anything unless you are challenged. So and how is that determined? Well. <laughs> You know, that's one of the things that I think should be addressed hopefully in the future because it's very difficult to ascertain. I don't think there's an entity that decides. So you have to sort of decide for yourself and I suppose that's subject to even being challenged. I'm not exactly sure. In any event, um, in, in my case, it was clear that a group announced that they were intended to challenge and it was at that point that you are then supposed to 
uh, engage in a, in a campaign, which means you have to raise money, you have to talk to people about how, how you run a campaign. I was never a politician. So a judge in that position who has not been a politician is faced mm -hmm. with this whole overwhelming concept of, oh my gosh, I've got to run a campaign. What do I do? How do I go about it? And uh, there is a period of great wringing of hands because you go to your friends, most of whom are lawyers, but none of whom are really politicians either. Mm -hmm. So everybody is struggling trying to figure out what the best way to um, begin a campaign is. You have to designate like campaign chairman. Well, let's, let's actually, if you don't mind, let me actually ask you some specifics about uh, your experience. It, it, the, um, the, the group that opposed you, if you don't mind, Judge, if I no. can ask you some more specific. No. You were opposed by a group that, that challenged you on what point? Well, it was actually the same point as Justice Shaw's retention campaign. It was a group that were upset with the decision that invalidated the, the uh, parental consent for abortion, uh, uh, parental consent necessary for minors to obtain an abortion case that I referred to earlier okay. because it didn't have the judicial bypass. So they identified that one issue? They did, but it, because, uh, this is my speculation, I believe it to be correct, because they did not succeed in Justice Shaw's case by just targeting that abortion issue, the same group expanded and uh, uh, attempted this soft on crime campaign as, as an ancillary. Based upon what? I, I think it was just simply based on a, a various and sundry opinions dealing mm -hmm. with the death penalty, perhaps, in other criminal cases. I, you know, I think it's one of those campaigns, I believe, that um, attempts to generalize about specifics. Uh, for example, one of the justices that, uh, and, and there were overtones of other things too. Um, one, of the justice, one of the other justices on the panel had also signed on to Justice Shaw's opinion on abortion and wasn't challenged. Mm -hmm. So I think there are overtones of race and gender that occur. But in your case, this one group uh, identify the issues as your vote on the, the minors uh, having to uh, get parental consent before having an abortion. And they also question your, uh, your uh, positions with regards to the death penalty. So having, having well, it wasn't just the death penalty. They used the, 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 the terminology was soft on crime, which I've never really quite understood because surely no judge is for crime. Right. And uh, so I, I'm not, it's supposed to be a, a short, a shortcut, I suppose, for something, but I'm not. It's a convenient political soundbite. Yes, it, exactly so. All right, so they identify those issues. Yes. And then, and then what did you do? Well, you have to ask lawyers to serve as campaign uh, managers and ask them to establish a committee so that they can seek funds from, from so, lawyers, so, primarily so. because they're the only ones that really are interested in judicial, uh, in the judiciary in general, or know anything about it. And so they had to raise funds so, so that... And so did, how did, who did you, if you can tell yeah, me... Yeah, uh, Martha Barnett mm -hmm. was one of my campaign managers. Barbara Pariente, who mm -hmm. is now going through the same process, uh, was uh, worked with the campaign. Um, Gail Nelson, who had been a commissioner in, uh, in Tallahassee and was a friend, helped. Um, many, many people who were, I mean, Len Gilbert, I'm trying to think of all the people, so, so, members so, of the bar. So you basically had to reach out to uh, friends of yours yes. and say, I'm being challenged. Yes. Um, I am now entitled by law to, uh, uh, to defend myself. Right. But I can't really go out and raise money because it's inappropriate for a judge. So could you please see what you can do on your own? Right. Basically, that's it. And the money, you know, it was just a matter of, we, we didn't even really know what to do. We, we knew we needed it for travel. Mm -hmm. You had to appear at various and sundry Tiger Bay clubs to answer whatever and questions you And did you do you that? Could. I did. Um, I, I, was not, I, I was never very good at, at, the, at the preliminary speech. I was always, it was much more fun to do the question and answer, which okay. I became. Um, 
much more energized and interested in. You know, when, because you could then speak to the concerns that people had. Right. And I very much enjoyed doing that. All right. So, so when you did that at those different gatherings, you still can't tell people how you're going to no, vote in a matter. I mean, that's the problem. All you can do is explain what the merit retention system is and then respond to questions about, well, then what should you base your vote on? And you have to explain that it should be a judge's complete um, history, their, their, how they are viewed in terms of their integrity, their intelligence, their diligence. Do they work hard? Um, all of which you can certainly ask about. But in terms of how they would rule, I would end up saying something like, well, the only thing I can promise you is that if you're wrong, I'm not going to vote for you. I mean, there's not much else <laughs> very, to very say. reassuring. <laughs> well, hopefully in a judge it would be. But, uh, it sounds like that's the right message that you want to convey. Well, that's the message I thought had to be, had to be conveyed. And, and I think those other areas are certainly legitimate areas to inquire about. If you have a judge that takes 10 years to mm -hmm. issue an opinion, I think that's a legitimate area of concern and a legitimate area of uh, criticism. If someone um, consistently miss, miscites the law and clearly doesn't have the uh, intellectual ability to do the job, that's something that can be commented on. But uh, in terms of a particular opinion, that's a whole different matter, and I think a judge should be judged on their entire record, which is not to say that a particular opinion is insulated from criticism, but the criticism has to be direct and, in, and, and informed and intelligent, and the criticism should be directed towards whether or not the facts were correctly recited, whether or not the law was correctly cited, whether or not the logic uh, made, made sense, the conclusions derived from the premises. Um, and the, it's those areas that I think are legitimate. I don't think that you can simply say, well, the bottom line is this, and I don't agree with it, and therefore that judge should go. You, you know, there's also another problem with the merit retention system in that regard. When you have a contested election, you have two people running against each other for the same office so that one person can at least say, well, I'm better than the other person. But in a merit retention campaign, you're running against this fantasy or phantom person that the voter thinks represents them so that here is, here is the person running who has the office running against this make-believe person which the voter says if I oust this person, this new person is going to come in and agree with me on everything. And it's very difficult to fight that kind of a phantom. First of all, it's like, it's ridiculous because it's not going to happen. Well, whoever they get mm -hmm. is not going to agree with them on everything. And again, as I have said before, you don't want someone in a judicial position to rule as the majority wants every single time. And I have said before, if that's what you want, you should eliminate the judiciary and put in an 800 number uh, for voting on this side, an 800 number for voting on that side. I mean, the whole idea of a judiciary is to have an impartial person who is going to stand and assure that minority rights, constitutional rights are protected. Now, it, it seems to me, and I want to get into that in a little bit more detail in a second, but I want to finish what happened to you in 92. Ah, yes. Um, so you, um, you went through the retention vote and, and tell oh, us... Oh, I went through the campaign, which was extremely grueling because you were doing your job at the same right. time. And it, you, whatever money you can... Florida is a huge is. state. And at that time, there, you didn't have the Internet... Um, so you had to make sure that you traveled all over the so state. So you covered the whole state? I covered the whole state. From Panhandle to the Keys? Yes, yes. Fortunately, had some great surrogates to help um, at both ends. Uh, Buddy um, was a state attorney in Jacksonville. Why am I blanking on his name? Buddy, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Janet Reno in Miami. Uh, were both wonderful and helped, especially with this soft on crime campaign. Mm -hmm. And they were able to explain that you, you cannot hope, nor should you hope to have a judge who is going to 
affirm a guilty verdict every single time because mistakes are made and that's why you want judges who are neutral mm -hmm. and who are not afraid of government or the voters booth to do what has to be done. There's, these are complicated issues and there's a lot at stake. There are, they are extremely complicated mm -hmm. issues, that's right. And I think that what you need is a judge who is not afraid to affirm a guilty verdict, whether it's in a mm -hmm. death case or in a, any other kind of criminal case, but who is also not afraid to reverse it if mistakes have been made. And I, I think that's, that's the, you, you need a system that is going to assure judges who are going to be fearless in that regard either way. Judge, do you remember the, uh, the results uh, of the uh, retention vote? Um, well, you, I got you retained, won, obviously, but do you yes. remember the vote? I think it was 60-some. I think the other judges who didn't have challenges were maybe 65. Um, so it seemed like a foolish exercise mm -hmm. uh, in the end. I think also, if I'm not mistaken, I received more votes than any other person running for office. In, in your favor? Yes, but I, that, that's a hazy kind of thing. I've got an article, I'll send it to, to the, the historical society or whoever. Okay. Yes, it's an interesting, it was an interesting experience. So let, let's talk about the retention issue because and you and I had a very uh, interesting conversation before uh, the camera interview about the process. It was designed to address the evils that you mentioned right. and to attain the goals that, that you aspire to, to obtain, yet it seems imperfect. Yes, I think, I think there are a lot of problems mm -hmm. with it. First of all, how, how you designate whether there's opposition so that in some states, for example, opposition arose a month before the election and it was opposition that was funded with great sums of money so that it made it impossible for the judge, incumbent judge, to fight against something like that in a, in a, in a, in a month. Um, I think those things have to be addressed. The coverage of merit retention mm -hmm. campaigns it ha ha have many inherent problems in them that I think have never been appropriately addressed. For, for example, one of the examples that I was talking about was that if, if allegations were, if factual allegations were made against a candidate, they would never be printed in the paper without a reporter checking out the facts and making sure that they were in fact so. And the editor's review and approval. And yes, indeed. Whereas if someone's alleging that an opinion of yours holds something, for example, in my case, we had a, the Browning case where um, a woman chose to terminate her and had left instructions to terminate her life support systems if it was determined that they were doing nothing but keeping her alive for another few days. Um, and we ruled that she had the right to do that. That was her body and that was her choice and uh, that's the way we ruled. But it was characterized by some of my um, unscrupulous opponents as saying that I had ruled as, uh, and the court had followed my ruling uh, that euthanasia was permitted in Florida. Well, clearly that wasn't euthanasia and it wasn't permitted in Florida. But the, the reporters, rather than reading the opinion, might be prone and in some cases were prone to, uh, to report that this allegation had been made. And I think that's no different than a factual al allegation which reporters and editors have an absolute obligation to examine before they report it. It's easy to attack in a 10-second uh, soundbite, but it's difficult to, def to explain a 60-page reasoning. Right. Except a, that you can certainly at least ascertain that however it's being characterized is incorrect. You can at least do that. And you think but, that so the coverage is bad. The difficulty of raising money is bad. The, also the difficulty that appell you know, appellate judges necess not, are not necessarily the most... Um, uh, garrulous and uh, uh, how can I put this? I mean, Political it, animals? Yes, <laughs> or even people persons uh, necessarily. Some people love to have the social interaction, others are quieter mm -hmm. and don't lend them, uh, their personalities don't lend themselves to the kinds of things you have to undergo to run a, 
a campaign mm -hmm. of whatever kind, even a merit retention one. And it just seems terribly not fair or right or good for the country that we should be dependent on people who can interact mm -hmm. with, uh, with voters. I like to think of myself as a people person. You are. I love talking to people. I loved engaging with them. But I know that there are others who are as qualified as I am who find that very difficult and distasteful. And I think it's not right that we should be limiting um, uh, options based upon having to campaign, as it were. So but, I think it's a terrible system. But now let's talk about the voting. Uh, yes. Obviously, it's America, so uh, people are entitled to vote uh, however they wish, yes. for whatever reason. Unless you don't subject the whole process to a vote. Meaning? Well, if you didn't have merit retention right. elections or if you didn't have contested elections in the judiciary, as you do not have them in the federal system, we do not have a vote in the federal system. We are nominated by the president, subject to the approval of the Senate. Um, and in many states, like this one, uh, your qualifications are reviewed before even the president uh, looks at a particular candidate. I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the federal system of, uh, of maintaining judges for life has worked pretty well for our uh, system of government. I, th I think it has. I think it has. Now, do you think we can do some variation of that here in Florida? I don't know. All I do know is that you do have to have some way of addressing the concerns that I've expressed when you have judges submitting themselves to a popular vote. Mm -hmm. Right, Your Honor. Is there anything else you wish to add? I think we've covered just about everything, haven't we? Well, you have a, a rich uh, background <laughs> that we can get into, but I think that's for uh, another no, day. Another day? That's for another, thank All you, right. Judge. I, I do think, I do want to say this. I recognize, well, let, me, let, me, let me add one more thing. Uh, and please. that is that I recognize that, um, that in addition to the idea of establishing a system that will assure fair and impartial and neutral judges as much as possible and that no system is perfect. So every system is going to have some problems. Mm -hmm. But given that, a component of it has to be, I think, that, that there is some way of assuring judicial accountability. Because you can do everything you can to make sure that you start out with a judge like that, but you never know maybe there will be a, a situation or an occasion. And, and in that sense, I think the public is entitled to know that there is a mechanism also to assure uh, judicial accountability. But when I say judicial mm -hmm. accountability, I'm not talking about ruling with the majority on mm -hmm. substantive issues. I'm talking about assuring that judges go to work and do their job and do it expeditiously and stay up to speed with the law. and. Uh, and render impartial judgments, regardless of how they come out uh, in the end. So, uh, I, th 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 there has to be both. Well, you either have elections of retention, or you either have a, an appointment for life, or there could be a third way. You could have an appointment for, uh, without a retention, for a limited term of years. A term of years. You 10, 15, for example. Uh, where the judges would have the independence to, uh, to act within that period of time. Correct. Yes, that's without what? the fear of, of. But then you'd also have to make sure that the process of appointing them uh, generated a was generated by a system that assured fair and impartial judges, and not political judges mm -hmm. or judges who were picked because of their political affiliation with whoever the entity was that was in power at the time. Uh, that would be the fear that, that uh, I would have, which is not to say that, you know, that some, somewhat doesn't exist. Well, we have that in the federal scheme. Yeah. And it's worked pretty well for us. It has. Uh, you know, but there have been instances where people have been appointed that perhaps were not as qualified as others. True. So, I w you know, and... So, I mean, that's true. You, have, you do have that, and it is a system. It's not a perfect system, but it's certainly a better system than elections. Right. It just seems to me, and you and I were talking about this, that uh, as long as you, have, uh, if you give the people the, the right to vote, even in a retention election, 
and no matter how hard you try to ensure that uh, the decision is based upon an informed understanding of how judges decide their cases. At the end of the day, there is a, a factor of popularity that comes into play. It does. I, I think you can't argue with that. So hopefully um, we'll be able to find a better system. <laughs>